we've been in the game for 25 years and all of a sudden it's, it's changed. The whole thing's changed. And we had to reinvent everything from scratch, um, like everyone else. And we basically had to decide how do we keep our staff we obviously thought the only way to do it is to, to really create that revenue, extra revenue, and we had to go out and find it. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The pandemic has forced operators to do things they never imagined just to survive. A stopgap until you can get back to business and start feeding people in your restaurant or cafe. But what happens when the model you create generates good business and goodwill? And by the time restrictions ease and offer a chance to open your restaurant again, it leaves you with a conundrum. Pasquale Tromboli is the owner of Italian Sons in Canberra, an award-winning Haddad establishment that has become known as not only one of the best in the capital, but in Australia too. Mate, how are you going? Good, good. Thanks uh, for having me. Um, there's lots to talk about here because, uh, you know, many people have been sort of working every hour of the day to save their businesses and you're definitely one of those. You've uh, triggered so many different things and uh, been very active. But can you just tell us sort of the immediate impact of the pandemic when it um, first landed for you? And, you know, you not only have Italian sons, but you have a couple of establishments here in Canberra and um, I'd like to talk about all of them yeah. actually. Yeah, look, it was um, it was pretty uh, memorable. I mean, I suppose it was it was around that afternoon when we all found out that there were restrictions coming in. But you just it didn't sink in. Uh, you didn't think it was going to happen until you started to reshuffle the tables and chairs and realise, you know, what the hell are we really going to be doing this many less numbers on a Friday Saturday night? And and that's when it's sort of like, you know hit me especially for me because you know i'm not one to be told what to do especially you know when it comes to this stuff and and all of a sudden it's been forced on us we have no choice well italian and sons is you know bustling you know elbow to elbow you know italian restaurant and you know i mean what was the reality before the closure as well of of spacing guests you know was it did you feel like you were going to close before the forced closure? No, look, it was. Um, it's. It's. You're exactly right saying that um, we're one of those places that really uh, the vibe is created by the the whole aspect of uh, and feel of you know being shoulder to shoulder and crowded and a little bit you know you know obviously probably not the right thing to say in this current uh, stage we're in, but you know. Months ago, if you had have told me, you know, shoulder to shoulder and, and uh, crowded, that's the vibe and that's what Italian Sons um, was all about. And, and you yeah, know, the reality of it is, I mean, we can go into stuff later on, but the reality of it is that is where you generate your, your income um, and it's to do with numbers at the end of the day, but at the same time, it's delivering that vibe and that feel and... And that's where it really it sort of hit us because we thought, what what's uh, in particular for Italian sons? What's the future hold for us if this is the case, and how long is it going to go for? What was the immediate impact on your restaurants? Did you have to let staff go and um, rethink everything that you do? Yeah, we did. Look, we didn't have to let uh, too many staff go. We were pretty fortunate there. That was one of our priorities. Um, we sort of. My brothers and I just sat down and we, we thought, let's map this out quickly and see where we're heading. We, we heard all the rumours and all the talk and we thought, what's going on? Is it really going to happen? But once it did happen, we were already half prepared. Um, we were trying to sort of stay ahead of the game, but our priority was to keep uh, not only ourselves employed and our income, but it was also a matter of trying to keep our key players employed and our key players in the current in the environment that we have in Canberra, it's really your kitchen staff. The key you need as a restaurant, you need every single member, be it floor or kitchen. But with the way it's structured here in, in such a small regional town, a lot of your floor staff are casuals and uni students and they come and go. So the full timers were your, your kitchen staff. 
and that was our priority and that's what we thought how do we go about doing this and uh, it was a real struggle to to sort of come to terms and, and plan that out but once we did we we really um, took it on board and ran with it it was something that we took and it took it uh, almost as a challenge it was just crazy times both for staff and for myself and for my wife and the family you know it was just um, all hands uh, on deck how did you feel in those early stages what was the, what was the impact on you personally well personally it was a bit of a as I said, it was one of those things, is this really happening? What's happening? Why, why are we going through this? And we all understand why we needed to do this and why we had to do it. But, I mean, I was more struggling with the idea of why the industry had been hit or almost targeted and why is it that you can go down the road into a supermarket and everyone's fighting like cats and dogs for a toilet roll of paper, um, yet we can't sit more than, you know, half a restaurant and obviously up until now we're only at 20 people um and that's that's been the whole thing with me it's like well this is just absurd i understand what the government's doing and i know they've been supportive and all these sorts of things are coming through and the, the subsidies are great but for us it was just it was a thing where you had to say we've been in the game for 25 years and all of a sudden it's it's changed the whole thing's changed um, and we had to reinvent everything from scratch um, like everyone else and we basically had to decide we keep our staff how do we keep our staff we obviously thought the only way to do it is to, to really create that revenue extra revenue and we had to go out and find it well let's explore that because you know Italian and Sons and you got Metzalera and um, Bacaro at the back and you know, you set a pretty mean standard in the country for Italian and you've never done takeaway with Italian and Sons and your pizza is arguably the best in Australia and, you know, the Canberrans have always wanted it takeaway and you've resisted. I wondered if you could tell us why that was initially and it's actually been a real success for you during this period, um, having that model to be able to roll out. Yeah, look, it has been. It's it's worked in our favour in in the current scenario that we have now. Um, that sort of slight bit of arrogance where you say this is what we do, this is how we do it, and we don't waver too far from it. Um, it's almost created a bit of a, a euphoria where, wow, I can now have Italian sons at home, and and we resisted for such a long time. Um, so the minute we went to the market with that, it was. Um, it was quite successful. I mean, when I say successful, it's successful in, successful in the comparison to um, what you hear other restaurants are doing. We were still 60% down during that takeaway period um, from normal figures, which is crazy numbers. And if you had have told me that, you know, three months ago, I would have said, no way in hell would I be happy doing those numbers. But when it's been forced on you, that the numbers weren't bad considering what you were hearing from other places. However, it was a it was one of those things that we resisted for such a long time. We were um, always against putting our product or food into a box and sending it off. But we we did take it on board, funnily enough, probably more so than other places that were more flexible and a little bit more. Uh, Happy, happily doing that. Uh, we, we were pretty fluid in the whole process. It was just uh, almost crazy how we took it on board and changed and went out looking for this extra revenue stream and other revenue streams to go with it. But the, the priority was to keep our staff employed and, and keep the restaurant alive and come out at the other end with some sort of relative, you know, integrity at the same time because there's a lot of things we can talk about, but there's a lot of things that you need to understand when you are running a restaurant, I believe personally, it's it comes back to your personality. And, and restaurants are an extension of your personality, really. And if they're not, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. And restaurants are not about, making money we always believe that's a byproduct of 
delivering the right product. And this was really one of those periods where we actually had to reflect on everything from A to Z, be it the brand, what you're about, why you're doing it. Is it just purely to put, you know, a roof over your head? Is it purely just to make extra money so you can buy the extra, you know, three-car garage or the extra holiday? Or, or what really are you doing it for? What is it for? And and that's where there was a lot of questions being asked, not just for ourselves, but also how do we also um, keep our staff there and also we, we're responsible for them as well. They've all got mortgages and payments and other things going on that they need to cover and we don't want to be starting from scratch when we come out of it at the same time. So we, we just uh, jumped straight in um, all the way through and we were online from, I believe it was the Thursday night um, before the Sunday when they announced they were locking it down and closing restaurants. So we already had a, an online model that we developed with um, our app guy up in Brisbane that we were working all week leading into it, um, which, we again, we hadn't done takeaway, and then all of a sudden we're doing online orders. How did that feel, you know, after resisting it for so long and then being forced into it? You know, how were you feeling at that time about doing it and, and the integrity of your product? Yeah, look, the integrity was always that question mark. It was all about, um, you know, how can we let this go into a box or how can we let this go into a takeaway container? Um, but there was it was a nice feeling when you saw how well the, the market reacted to it. Um, I remember being there on a Saturday night and the restaurant was just pumping along. It was before the restrictions. And next thing you know, all the orders were shooting through on the takeaway and we just thought, this is crazy. We've created a monster, you know. Um, and it was a nice feeling because it's that local support that was coming through and and that's what Canberra's uh, built on. And also, it probably was also a little bit more uh, satis or satisfying in the sense that you've been doing it for such a long period of time in, in a small community, and it's nice that people can still recognise you and appreciate what you do. And it's not just the dining experience, but they're happy to have food in their own home. You know, Takeaway wasn't the only initiative that you triggered to try and um, get another income stream in. Um, did you ever imagine having Italian and Sons in an IGA supermarket? Never, never. It was uh, <laughs> it was one of those things that uh, we we at home, Katarina and I, my wife, uh, we were developing products. Uh, we always had it in the back of our mind. One day, wouldn't it be nice to go and do something outside of restaurants to another level and create a different business and all these sort of things? But at the same time, it wasn't something we expected to happen so suddenly. And um, you know, we were we were playing around with uh, stuff at home where we were rolling out um, pizzas with uh, the kids' IKEA rolling pins and uh, three, four different bases and throwing them in the oven. And oh, you know, we'll cook this for ten minutes and we'll do it at you know two fifty. And oh, look, this is better and that's great or that's not great. And just playing around with things like that, you know, and getting involved in it and feeling like we need to be sure that if we go somewhere like an IGA or we do something like that, which has turned out to be quite um, successful, um, it still needs to be the Italian and Sons experience. And we can't just jump in and be like every other uh, supplier, distributor or producer out there. We wanted something different. And that's where, you know, it's just one of those things where you do throw your whole time into it. And I have to say, we've been working so much uh, harder in the last three months. It's almost uh, that, that analogy of the um, duck swimming in a pond where the legs are just going frantically underneath. And you put everything on hold and it looks so glossy from the outside and streamlined, yet... It's just a constant battle every day, every night. You're just thinking about what can we do, how do we do it, and the IGA thing was um, it was also a bit of a a bit of 
um, a leap of faith, you know, in, in the product and what we do because I remember we put uh, we, we approached the guys up at um, one of the local IGAs here in Canberra and, and they couldn't believe that we were even talking to them about the product. And next thing you know, within a week we had our first order and within, I think it was three hours of the first delivery, the order tripled and they came back to us and said, we want three times what we just got today. We've already sold out. Wow. Yeah, it was crazy. It was just um, one of those things. We had the biggest smile on our face, but it was also what have we done? Can we really uh, carry through with this? Are we going to be able to keep up with the demand? So we were really throwing ourselves in on that th- deep end and throwing ourselves into something we had never even experienced and we were just winging it as we went. And to give some context to like Ainsley IGA is a pretty extraordinary um, version of an IGA with, um, you know, arguably the best cheese uh, section in Canberra. And um, if you're going to put something in a supermarket that's your standard, I guess that's one that you would target. Can you give us an idea of the sort of products that you put in to the IGA there and um, what's been really successful? Yeah, so what we we developed um, over time, we have uh, recently developed uh, a really strong uh, gluten-free uh, following with the pastas. So we put our gluten-free pasta into it. Uh, then we did different um, other versions of, of the same recipe. And then we uh, developed some sauces to go with it. And then we had our, um, well, the, the guys up at the IGA were just saying, you know, your pizzas are fantastic. How can we get them to the people? Um, they can't access them at the moment. Sure, they can have them take take a, or take away, take home, but how can we get the, uh, to the homes and um, where they can cook them themselves? And we developed a little strategy where we said, look, we can't do it on a, on a daily basis, but let's do it as a one-off every week. And it started out as a Friday. Um, let's de- deliver on the Friday morning and see how we go. And we were doing these hand-stretched bases. So it wasn't pre-cooked. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't one of these things that we wanted sitting in the fridge for a week or two weeks. It was literally, let's hand stretch them or develop a method where they can take them home and they've got two days to put them in the oven and they're going to be as close as to what we do without having a wood-fired oven. And so we developed the whole pizza kit with the sauce, the cheese and the dough, which was hand stretched um, of that day, on the day. Uh, which has been going gangbusters, and we've now developed that through onto our weekends now. So it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Well, this whole situation with the boom of the takeaway for you and also the retail arm, and I know it doesn't get the same revenue as what Italian and Sons used to do, but given the size of Italian and Sons in the kitchen and the sort of elbow to elbow sort of space that it is, it's left you with a bit of a conundrum because you've got the takeaway, you've got you know a really good retail model a small space, and now there's restrictions on seatings. You know, what sort of place are you in about the future of the restaurant and when, when you're going to sort of swing the doors open and try and balance all three? Well, that's the thing. I mean, we've got – we have developed um, a bit of a problem. Um, it's a good problem to have, but we are still low on the numbers. It's not like we're, we're out there um, delivering the same budget levels and, and revenue uh, – targets that we were previously we're still down a good you know 40 percent um but what we have done is we have developed uh a new following we've extended ourselves to new clients um and we're now thinking it's a question of what do we give away to come back on board because ultimately let's face it the, the reality of it is we are a restaurant and there is nothing better than being in the restaurant and serving clients and that buzz of, of being in a busy uh, service. And, and that's what, what it's all about. Um, the takeaway sounds great. It's fun. We're spending so much more time with our families and, and all that is tremendous. And we've built some uh, new habits and, and new regimes and things that we do now as a family, 
And that's almost hard to let that go, going back into service. Um, so there's a lot of uh, questions. What do we give away? What don't we give away? We, we were always of the opinion when it came to the businesses that we needed to be ahead of the market. We didn't want to just be someone that was following. And we, we were trying to stay ahead with, uh, we knew takeaway wasn't going to be there forever and we're still doing takeaway and we just recently opened up the doors as of last week. Um, the numbers have been great. Coming through the restaurant's been uh, super busy. Uh, however, uh, you can see that the takeaway elements dropped off. Uh, we're still doing a lot of our ready meal kits, which have been pretty successful um, on a weekend basis. Where we uh, we thought, you know, we don't have to necessarily stick to the takeaway model. There's other streams that we can do uh, where we can actually have someone sitting at home in their tracksuit pants enjoying, you know, one of our dishes at their own leisure you know it's one of those um things that we were trying to work out how many different ways we could effectively deliver the experience at home and we developed an e-com site uh with our guy up in brisbane uh we had the wine bottle shop element um online as well we had the app guys with uh, hungry hungry who we work with closely to develop a new app for our takeaway. And so we've got all these things in place and we've invested so much time and energy to do all of this where we've pretty much put our lives on hold. And as much as you, you want to get back into the restaurant game and say, this is awesome, let's get back into it, that's what we've been doing for 25 years, you sort of don't want to give away what you've created in the last eight weeks or so either because... There's also the element of we don't know, there's that uncertainty, we don't know what's around the corner. Could we be slapped with another restriction? Um, everything seems to be heading in the right direction, but where is it really heading? Um, so it was a question of uh, a lot of different things happening and we're now in a position where we are trying to still achieve that target of getting back to where we were. Um, as far as figures go, we were super successful in keeping our staff. We only let, uh, out of 15 kitchen staff, we only had to let one go. But that also meant that I was working um, a long, long hours uh, with the staff. And I remember having meetings. So the staff were really, um, in all honesty, they're, they're a great bunch of guys. We've had some really good staff over the years. But there was always that one or two, you know, that thought that it was all too easy and this is great. And believe it or not, even in times such as this, um, we'd even have the arrogance to show up late or to say they don't need the extra shift or whatever it may be. And here we are busting our gut to try and keep ourselves employed and themselves employed and you have to listen to someone say that. And there was a few times where we had meetings and we said, guys, do you understand I am working so much harder to try and keep not just the brand, the business and my own uh, wage and integrity and brand going, but we're also trying to keep you guys employed. Um, you, we don't want to send you out on the street as much as the same time we don't want to be looking for new staff in you know a month's time or two months time or whatever it may be and it, it was this constant sort of juggling act with uh, staff where you they thought that it was too easy because they could see the the orders coming in with the iga they could see the orders coming in with the takeaway they saw the ready meal kits uh, you know mother's day was crazy with ready meal kits we were just going through big numbers on, on that sort of stuff. And it was all because both my brothers and I, Katerina, my wife, we were all working so much, uh, we were doing so many extra hours to develop the brand, to develop the labels, to develop the products and get them out there. I mean, literally we were on, and we still are doing it today, every Saturday morning it's me and Katerina and we load the car up and we're off with the kids 
up to the IGA and we're delivering this stuff, you know. So we're sticking on the labels, we're packaging the stuff, we're delivering it, we're doing the whole thing. And you, then you have to listen to some staff say, well, hang on, um, I don't know if I want that extra shift, you know. And then it's, you know, it's, it's almost uh, gut-wrenching, you know, when you hear this sort of stuff because you say, sure, I'm doing it for me, but I'm also doing it for them. And, and that's, that was this whole uh, period where we thought, are we making it look too easy, you know, even though it's not? You know, that, and that's, that's also why you don't want to give away too much of what you have created because you have put so much time into it. What surprised you about this whole experience? Uh, the surprising thing would, would probably be, uh, like I said, I think earlier, was the reaction we got uh, with uh, these new revenue uh, streams. Um, it was obviously something we had never considered. And I, I would have to say it would, be, it would all come back to one thing. And we're, we have to, I would have to say it would be the brand, how strong the brand is. Um, and I'm a big believer that you, you have to put your ego aside in these times and say, we're going to go out there and we're going to try and achieve what we have to achieve. And in this case, it was all about staying alive and surviving. But the brand was actually stronger than what I gave or actually thought it was. I didn't give it as much, uh, recognition as it deserved and once you got out there and you delivered it in a different format it was amazing to see what uh or how people reacted to it well given um the impact and the realization of the the brand uh in the community you know do you think there's a bigger opportunity for your products you know like through iga or you know following that path as a, as a part of what you do in the future Look, I, I definitely think there is. Um, there's certainly um, a, a lo- another business in it, effectively. Um, it just depends, again, what you really want to keep and what you don't want to keep. And you, you sort of have to keep your eye on the ball about uh, the brand and what it is and, and the Italian and Sons and why have you worked so hard to develop and deliver the restaurant and... Now you might be, you know, selling it off in a different format. So I, I certainly, it's one of those businesses that could easily turn into something. Um, and we've had lots of conversations about this and how far we would take it and if we wanted to take it uh, to another city for that matter. Um, we have had an amazing uh, response, but the question comes back to reminding yourself that it's not all about money, that we need to take a back back seat sometimes and remind ourselves um, why you got into the game, why you're doing it. And like I said, it's it's not – this isn't the time to be focusing on dollars. It's a time to be focusing on your product and – it's not even a time to be penny pinching. It's a time we thought when you have to be generous. Um, and I saw it happen in a few places around town where people saw it as an opportunity to take a quick grab and up their prices or charge the same prices as they would if someone was sitting in the restaurant and things like that. And, and so that's where we, we don't focus on, on those sort of things. Um, and we're very fortunate in that, that we've, always had this mindset, like I mentioned earlier, you should never feel like you're number one. If you feel like you're number two, you'll go on forever and ever and ever. The minute you think you're number one, you're gone, you're dead. And and that's where that mindset has served us well over that 25-year period. A little earlier you said um, you need to remember why you got in the game. And I'd love to hear the story of how you started in hospitality. Oh, look, it's a funny one. It's, um, it's one of those, uh, it's <laughs> effectively, 
it's a family business. Um, my brothers and I, there's four boys in the family, uh, one a lot younger, uh, 11 years younger than me, but effectively there's three old, or two older brothers and myself who, who were uh, heavily involved. And we all went out and did our university degrees and that was the focus as a kid growing up. You know, It was all about the reason why your parents came here to Australia in the first instance, and that was to give us a bigger and better future. And for them, that was going to school, going to uni and doing all those sorts of things. And it was funny, you know, because we had never even worked in a restaurant, not any of us. Um, and next thing you know, my dad sees a site, goes, oh, yeah, he was in the deli game for 40 years. And he goes, we should do a restaurant. You know, everyone seems to be making so much money out of these restaurants. Why don't we give it a go? And, and you know, I was 22, 23 at the time, and I just had finished my architecture degree. And I was working with these guys down the road from where the site was. And I was like, yeah, this is great. Why not? You know, how, how good would this be? You know, the whole, this was back in the uh, mid-90s. So, you know, it was that whole Marco Pierre White sort of stuff, you know, where it was all, just uh, coming out, it was all that, uh, I won't say drugs and sex and all that sort of stuff, but it was all <laughs> that rock and roll sort of, <laughs> you know. And as a young kid, that's like, how good is this? This is fantastic. Um, and and we had a good budget for, for the site, so we thought, let's give it a roll. And I had a little opportunity to throw a bit of architectural input into it. And so for me, it was ticking all the boxes in, in many ways. But it probably wasn't until a few years after that when you realised, uh, I think it was the first 12 months actually, that I realised, hang on, I can't keep doing this. I was actually working with the architects during the day and doing the restaurant at night and my brothers had given up their jobs uh, with the law. Uh, one did law, uh, the other one did accounting. And we were all in the restaurant. Before you knew it, we were all in there doing our thing. And we basically gave away our jobs. Um, I mean, I'd only been doing it for about a year, but pretty much we, we threw ourselves into the game. And we, we basically learnt the, the skills of being in uh, hospitality um, through, uh, primarily through our parents and through just our upbringing, but the actual skills of you know carrying three plates or silver serving or understanding the the whole concept was was pretty much we learnt through our staff and we weren't we weren't ever too proud uh, to sort of do that you know and we know a lot of people that wouldn't do that because they say well I'm the guy who's throwing the money in it's my business why am I going to look at you and, and learn from you um, but. We we're pretty humble in that aspect. Um, that that's how we came into the game, you know. And we thought, well, if we don't know how to carry three plates, someone's going to show me. And and once we learned how to do it, we were then training other people how to do it. But the the idea of uh, hospitality is um, comes down to the way you were brought up. And and I always say that I always say this even today uh, to the staff. Um, just think about it. It's simple. It's no different to someone coming to your home. You open the door, you greet them, you sit them down, you entertain them, you offer them a drink, you might have something to eat, and when you leave, you grab the door, say thank you, and we'll see you next time. And that's hospitality. What has the pandemic made you appreciate about the industry? It's actually, uh, it has made us appreciate um if I have to say, it's probably made us appreciate how valuable your time is and family. And it's also made you understand how you have to be quite humble in your approach. Um, we can all get carried away with, with this industry a little bit. Um, it's almost like, you know, the analogy of the, the sportsman reading the back page, you know, shouldn't do it, and you're gone. And a lot of us, uh, we're in an industry that's quite 
uh, as you know, is an industry that, that gets written up quite a lot. And it's too easy to, to read your own, you know, BS sometimes because it's all about someone writing about your restaurant. It's not someone writing about you. And there's a lot of people out there that start believing that, that the write-up is about them rather than the restaurant. And, and that's when they start walking around with the wrong attitude. And so this, this whole period's taught us to sort of take a step back and realise, yeah, you might be driving it, but you're not the brand. You are driving it, but it's beyond you. And you have to be humble enough to understand that and, and realise that you are providing not just for yourself, and, and this is what it taught us, you're providing for others. And it was, you, you, you always have that idea in your head because you know you see the money flowing out and, and as you know restaurants are all about high volume and low margin and the biggest expense that we have are wages and we we see the checks going out every week and you go wow are we really employing that many people but you never stop and think are you responsible for those people and that's what this has really come down to you're responsible not just for yourself and for your family, but you're responsible for others. And in our case, we've got quite quite a few. And and that's what it really taught you is to to be quite humble and and realise that this is a, a big beast of a thing and, and you really need to um, appreciate it for what it is. Well, mate, when all of the restrictions ease and the restaurant is completely full again and bustling along as it does and you're you're on the floor doing what you do best. How's it going to feel? Yeah, look, it's, it's going to feel quite odd. Um, I won't be getting the uh, early uh, the early finishes. Um, that was one benefit of the uh, takeaway. It was like, uh, well, I'll be home at 9 o'clock um, sort of thing. But it it's nice to interact uh, with people because, I mean, let's face it, that's, that's what we do. That's our game. And, and when you've done it for so long, um, you know, it'd be nice to get all the old clients back in again. And we have so many great uh, clients that have supported us even through this period in the takeaway format or the ready meal format. And it's, it's going to be fun. And we know that the idea is that's what your business is all about. Um, and we do hope to get back on board, but it, it's still going to be quite concerning for us as to where we are heading with all of it because we just don't know uh, are, they gonna, are the clients that we used to have, are they going to be coming back? Have they found a different venue? Is it a different habit? Or are they even happy to sit in a restaurant again? And, and that's the whole concern that we have as an industry. And, and I'm pretty strong in all this. I actually think that as an industry, we are not going to see the same numbers again for a good two, three-year period. And, and anyone that thinks that they're going to open their doors and the numbers are going to go back to what they were pre-pandemic is kidding themselves. Um, this industry is yet to see the worst of it. Uh, we're only at the beginning. So the doors may open, but I still think we're going to see the worst of it in the next three to six months. Well, let's hope during that period that um, all of these activations that you've had um, keep um, pushing forward um, and really look forward to seeing if uh, the retail arm extends beyond just uh, sort of local IGAs. Um, mate, really appreciate your time today. And please keep in touch because I'm really looking forward to see what happens with Italian Sons moving forward. Thanks, Zach. I appreciate it. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospo community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.